Schengen, feeding the world Asia's prospect of plenty. That was the theme of the conference you just attended in Hong Kong. The title points to the fact that Asia is somewhat unique in a number of indicators. Population size, population structure, food consumption patterns, etc. From the discussions at the conference now, what do you think is unique about the way Asia is dealing with food security issues? Well, firstly, the Asia is facing tremendous challenges, as well as uh, opportunities in feeding its own population, which accounts for the majority of the population in the world. The uniqueness of this conference is that there is a close interaction among the private sector, uh, academia, research institutions, the government, and other stakeholders. And where different stakeholders can really have a very, very fair dialogue to share information, share their perspectives, and to share their frustrations, uh, how they can work together. Yeah. So what can be learned from Asia? Surely not sharing frustrations only. I'm, I'm sure they do something very different there. Yes. Well, well, what can we learn from Asia? Well, Asia, obviously, is a very dynamic region. The economy is growing very fast. A uh, large amount of people have been moved out of poverty and hunger. But today, Asia still has a large number of hungry people, malnutrition people. And there is a disconnect between overall economic growth, or even agriculture growth, and hunger reduction and poverty reduction. And among Asian countries, there is a heterogeneity. So the countries within Asia can actually learn from each other. For example, China, Vietnam have been able to reduce the number of hungry people, malnourished people, through its economic growth. On the other hand, in South Asia, like India, where there is still a dislink between growth and a poverty reduction or hunger reduction. In other words, despite rapid agriculture growth, despite rapid economic growth, the hunger level, the malnutrition level remain very high. So the experience from the different countries can be shared. So Africa as an extremely hunger-ridden continent, is there anything that this continent can take, especially from, from the conference there now? Well, yes, indeed. There are lessons to be shared from Asia with other many different regions, Africa in particular. One is Africa still needs a green revolution, so where the crop productivity, crop yield can be enhanced substantially by using or by adopting high yielding varieties. But the African Green Revolution should also avoid some of the, some of the mistakes or some of the lessons the Asian Green Revolution had. For example, very uh, intense, intensive use of inputs, particularly like fertilizers uh, and uh, the depletion of underground water, a loss of diversification of, of food production, so some of the lessons from Asia definitely can be shared with Africa. So the African Green Revolution should be the higher productivity, but in the meantime, the productivity growth should be more sustainable uh, in terms of its environmental impact and in terms of nutrition. In July, the magazine The Economist, which was the organizer of the conference you, you just attended, launched the Global Food Security Index 2012. This was commissioned by the multinational company DuPont. So this is a new trend. What is the added value of this index? Well, there are many indexes, as you know. The Global Hunger Index, the Agricultural Index, so many indexes. So how does this index differ from others? One is it is promoted by the private sector, the DuPont. And it's uh, conducted by a very reputable uh, institution, economist. More important is more detailed information related to uh, food security. For example, uh, there are indicators related to uh, 
food availability, to food accessibility, food utilization, and nutrition. So the positive side of this impact is there are more disaggregated indicators relevant or related to food security. But the challenging part is it is very difficult to connect all this data in a timely fashion. You know, it's very costly to connect more than 40 indicators related to food security. So that's the challenge you know, this index uh, will face in the future. What do you think is the new involvement of private companies all about? Will it change the donors, for example, approach food security issues as private companies move in? And maybe there's also some other interests and from them moving into that direction and involving themselves in, in, uh, in research and issues that they previously had not been involved in. For the private sector in the last several years, it has really become very active in supporting global food security agenda. Uh, their involvement in the World Economic Forum, Davos, their involvement in G8, G20, G20 in Mexico, the private sector is actively engaged. So they are committed. They wanted to promote socially responsible business practice while they are also uh, promoting their own business. So I truly believe there are win-win opportunities. So the private sector can promote their business. And in the meantime, they can also help the whole society to achieve more broader social development outcomes, such as poverty reduction, hunger reduction, monetation reduction, more sustainable uh, development in the future. So I do see the commitment from the private sector, and many private sectors have moved towards that direction. Now, we talked already about particular lessons learned from this conference. We here with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, obviously strong interest in agriculture. Is there a particular lesson that you might want to point out to the members of the Global Donor Platform as being of value to them, maybe? Well, fortunately, Increasing investment in agriculture, in agriculture research is critical for promoting future food and nutrition security. And a donor platform should continue to keep that message in mind. And particularly focusing on research and agriculture investment for smallholders. So smallholders will be able to benefit from agriculture investment, agriculture research investment. And the technology, the innovation through this investment should be smallholders friendly. And this investment should also help to promote more sustainable food production, to help to mitigate climate change, to help to save water, to save energy, and to save land. So this is one lesson that can also be shared with Africa, uh, with Africa, with Latin America. The second lesson we learned is the land investment or investment in land can bring win-win opportunities. But to realize this potential, there is a need of clear security and land security. So the smallholders have to have the land rights and their land rights have to be secured. So if they wanted to work with multinationals to provide their produce to link to global markets, so they can organize themselves, so they have a um, very strong voice, they also have strong bargaining power with the private sector, with multinationals. So in that case, the private sector will benefit from doing business from smallholders, and smallholders will benefit from producing more high-value production to supply to the global market. So the man is, is key, man can do. There is also a need of setting up a mechanisms and a matrix measure to track the private public partnership. If the private multinational companies wanted to engage with smallholders, value chain to bring smallholders production to global markets, there is a need of metrics to measure the impact of that value chain in terms of its environmental impact, water and land, climate change. Its impact on health, nutrition of the consumers, its impact on smallholders' income. 
So there is a need of a mechanism. There is a need of a set of metrics that can measure, track the, uh, the progress of this type of value chain. I would like to round the interview off now with a question on the partnership between IFRI and the Global Donor Platform, um, which has been there for quite some time. Where do you see the mutual benefits for both institutions of this partnership in tackling some of the issues that you just mentioned? Well, IFRI will benefit from the, the donor platform to make sure that if your research is relevant, to make sure that research, if research is demand driven, obviously our research is demanded by many stakeholders, including national governments, including the private sector, and also donor platform. So I think if we benefited from donor platform in terms of its relevance. And donor platform can also benefit from IPRI in terms of the knowledge, information, and policy options that donor platform can use in terms of its own work. Thank you very much, Shingen. Thank you.